I would like to start with a slogan or a statement by uh, Zubin Garamani in a paper in Nature uh, two years ago. There are several reasons why probabilistic programming could prove to be revolutionary for machine intelligence and scientific modeling. That's what he claims. Um, uh, I advise you to read this paper and try to see whether he's right or not. His main argument say, is that um, he's arguing that probabilistic programming obviates the need to manually provide inference methods, enables rapid prototyping of models, and gives a clear separation between the model and between the inference procedures. So what I will be talking about is what I call predictive probabilistic programming. Most probabilistic programs are analyzed by means of simulation. So they give sim I mean, guarantees in terms of confidence intervals. Um, it's not always clear when your simulation will terminate. Um, and um, my, my slogan will be, um, or our slogan in our research, is that verifiable programs are preferable to simulative guarantees. And the take on this in this talk is to reason on the code of the program. So I'm not going to talk about uh, models, um, like in the previous talk. And we would like to reason in a compositional manner. Good. The type of models I'm going to use in these talks uh, is a very simple uh, version of probabilistic graphical models. There are several versions of it, and I'm going to focus on uh, base networks. And the example I'm going to use is uh, basically the same as Le De Raad was using yesterday. So it's the student's mood after taking an exam. So uh, there are four random variables, uh, a difficulty of the exam, the preparation level of the student, the grade that the student gets depending of, of the difficulty and the preparation level, and then the mood of the student after uh, he or she gets the, uh, gets the result. And then uh, here you see probability, so the difficulty is uh, low with 0.6, it's high with 0.4, preparation levels are probabilistic, and then you see those conditional probability tables that tell you, okay, if the grade is low, uh, if, the, if the difficulty is low and the preparation level is low, then the grade will be low with 0.95% I mean, and so forth. Typical kind of questions people answer by means of base inference is things like this. How likely does a well-prepared student end up with a bad mood after getting a bad grade for an easy exam? Good. I'm going to show you later how you can determine this by means of program verification. Okay, so here's an example. In, in real life, those Bayesian networks are much more complicated. So this is actually uh, 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 an example for printer troubleshooting in Windows 95. And then uh, you see this is a, a base network with several inputs. And then questions that are people asking is, how likely is it that your print is garbled, given that the PS file is not, but the page orientation is portrait? And if you're interested in the example, there is a whole YouTube video only about this example, and I encourage you to, to look at this. Okay, so um, I'm going to argue that you can describe these kind of things very naturally in probabilistic programs. And a probabilistic program in my setting will be an imperative program. Yesterday we have seen logical programs. And these programs have two main ingredients, uh, in addition to the usual ingredients, uh, random assignments and conditioning. And I will give you some examples where we use them. But in particular, we're going to use conditioning for uh, reasoning about the conditions, evidences in base networks. There are many applications. Luc de Raad gave already a quite extensive uh, overview of the kind of applications. This is a more view from the formal verification point of view. Uh, people use programs and program verification <coughs> in, uh, on probabilistic things, on quantum and security. It's particular differential privacy. Um, but also, for instance, approximate computing, the group of Martin Rinard at MIT does a lot there in probabilistic programs. There are many languages already mentioned yesterday. So what I'm trying to do is I will first explain you a bit in detail what, are, uh, what is my, the language I'm going to use, which is a, an assembler language. And then I'm going to explain you probabilistic uh, weakest preconditions, which is a quantitative version of ordinary preconditions. I will do this briefly. And typically, there's more information on the slides that I'm able to capture here in the 45 minutes. But um, I hope that's OK. I will give you some intuition. Then I'm going to show you that actually program analysis, you can do exact base inference by means of program analysis. Then I'm going to talk a bit about termination because that will be an essential issue here because we will have loops. And the question is how to prove that a loop terminates with probability one, for instance. And then I'm going to focus on the four and five, the runtime analysis. I'm interested in how much time does a probabilistic program need on average. And I'm going to apply this to uh, analyze basically the expected sample time of a base network. And we're going to see that you can do this in a fully automated way. And I will give you some experiments, amongst others, on the Windows printer uh, troubleshooting example. OK, so let's start. And the starting point is a very simple language. It goes back to the people on the slide. 
where you have things that uh, the usual uh, kind of ingredients like skip divergence assignments, sequential compositions, if then else, and while loops. And there are two special ingredients indicated in red. One is called observe g, where g is something like a Boolean expression over the program variables, and um, proc1 p proc2. And this means that with probability p, you execute proc1. With probability 1 minus p, you execute proc2. P can be a value, but it can also be an expression in terms of the program variables. Okay? Good. So let's start a very simple example. We have two assignments. We flip a fair coin, x becomes 0 or x becomes 1. This pointer doesn't work on the screen. Then you assign uh, y minus 1 with 0.5 or y becomes 0. And then you observe that the sum of x and y equals 0. So what's the idea of this observe statement? Uh, basically, you block all the executions that violate the guard of the, obs of the, of the observe statement. Okay? So I hope you see that this program has two what we call feasible runs, namely all the runs that satisfy x plus y equals 0. Now, both runs have, of course, a probability a quarter, a half times a half. But because the two other runs are blocked, what you do is you renormalize and the two quarters become a half and a half. Okay? So the effect of this observe statement is actually that you yeah, normalize the probability of the feasible runs. Feasible means you satisfy all the observed statements in your program. This is a program with a loop. Um, you have a Boolean that controls the termination of the loop, and in every loop you flip a fair coin, or well, is a coin with probability p, not a fair coin in this case. And uh, with probability p, c is set to false and the loop will terminate. With probability 1 minus p, c is set to true, and you take another iteration of the loop. The rest, what the program does, it has a counter and it counts up. Okay, the observed statement at the end is that i is an odd number. Good, I hope you agree with me that up to here, up to the observed statement, this program is basically encoding a geometric distribution with parameter p. Okay, so what's the effect of the observed statement? The first thing that we need to do, we have to compute what's the probability of having a feasible run. And this is just a geometric series. Yeah, having a feasible run means you have to have two n plus one iterations, and this has this probability, so it's one over two minus p. And now what is the probability distribution that this program describes? It's a geometric distribution normalized with respect to this probability. So the outcome is the following. You get that the probability of having an even number is zero. The probability of having an odd number is the geometric distribution, but now normalized with this factor, and that gives you this multiplicative factor two, two minus p. Okay, so I hope you get some feeling about what this observation does. It renormalizes the distribution that a program describes. Okay, so actually what, a, what an observation does, another way of looking at this is in this program. Uh, here I replaced the observation by a repeat until odd, and basically that's the way to view it. You basically run your program, and if you do not satisfy the guard of the observe statement, uh, mentally think about you can restart the program as being fresh, and you do this until at some point you satisfy the guard. Yeah? And this program is semantically equivalent to the program I had before. Okay, now I want to reason about these programs and the kind of things we're going to do is the quantitative analog of weakest preconditions. Now the first thing is what is the quantitative analog of a predicate? A predicate typically maps a program state to zero, one. Now I'm going to map program states until non-negative real values and infinity. These are random variables. Yeah? The jargon of MacIver Morgan is they are called expectations, but they're just random variables. Okay? You can order them pointwise, so you can say f is at most g, if and only if for all states fs is below, is at most gs. And now what is an expectation transformer? It takes a random variable and maps it to a random variable. Good, it's like having a predicate transformer. And now you have a special predicate transformer, it's called the weakest precondition which is the quantitative analog of having a weakest precondition. So one way to view it is that the WP of P and F yields the least expectation E, which is a function again, right? It's a function mapping states on real numbers, on the initial state such that P terminates and, if it, and it terminates in satisfying the expectation F. So F is the postcondition, E is the precondition. Good. And one way to do this, if you like more hot triples, you can annotate your program as follows. E and F are now those expectations, those random variables, and you can annotate this program. This holds for total correctness, if and only if. E implies the WP. Implication here is this at most ordering in the quantitative thing. 
Sometimes you're interested in the weakest liberal pre-expectation, which you need for partial correctness, right? And that's intuitively, colloquially stated, this is basically the WP plus the probability that your program diverges. Good. You can define this uh, thing by induction on the structure of the program. So here are the possible structures of the program. And you can now give an inductive definition of the WP. So this is the WP of a program P <coughs> with respect to a post condition F. And for instance, if the program doesn't do anything, that of course the pre-expectation is the same as the post-expectation. If your program diverges is zero, which is the quantitative analog of false, and so forth, right? So uh, sequential composition is just function composition. And uh, probabilistic choice is perhaps interesting. It's a kind of a weighted choice. It's P times, it's a scalar product between P and the WP of the left alternative and the post condition plus one minus P of the WP of the right alternative. Okay, what's the semantics of a loop? It's a least fixed point uh, over which domain? Well, you take the domain of the expectations with the ordering I explained before. And mu of thing is the least fixed point. And the way to read this is that, okay, as long as the guard holds, right, then actually this, uh, these are the Iverson brackets. That means that this function becomes one. Then you need to have the WP of the body of the loop. And if the loop has terminated, then of course you have to establish the post condition. That's the second thing, okay? Good. Um, the WLP semantics fits on the same slide. You just have to change two things. This becomes one, right? Because the probability of diverging of such a program is equal to one. And this becomes a largest fixed point rather than the least fixed point. And that's the main difference. So to give you some feeling what you can do with this, um, let me show you uh, two, uh, three simple examples. So um, here we just have an example where x becomes five with probability four fifth and one fifth it becomes 10. And suppose I'm interested in the post expectation x, then what do you get if you do this backwards calculation? You can just ca calculate by means of the rules I showed you before. The WP of P and x is this weighted choice between the two assignments. And if you do the calculations right, it's six. So something like on expectation, the value on thing is six at the end, right? Now in general, they are not constants, but they're functions. So suppose now that I take this program, where I not set x to five, but x I increment by five. I do the same thing. I take the same post expectation as before. I do the calculations. And now you get a function, which is of course now a function in terms of x. Okay, one last example is the following. Now you ask yourself, same program as here. And now the post expectation says it's a predicate in fact, because this is one if x equals 10 and zero otherwise. And actually this says something about what is the probability that x equals 10 at the end of your program, intuitively speaking. And if you do the calculations, you get this. It's four times if x equals five, one plus one divided by five. So this says if x equals five, it's one. If x differs from five is one fifth. That's what the formula tells you. Okay, so I hope you get some feeling about what you can calculate by means of these WPs. And now you can prove something like a correctness if you want to know, uh, get some kind of feeling what this intuitively means. Um, you can take uh, now the normalization. Remember these observed statements normalize over the feasible runs. This normalization is here on the left hand side. So you take a post expectation F, now you take the WP, and now you do the normalization, but you do the normalization with the WLP because you also have to reflect the runs that are possibly diverging. Yeah, that's the intuition. And that means that this is the, let's say, the WP perspective of your program. What does that mean operationally? Well, I hope it's easy to see that every program is a Markov chain. It's a countably infinite Markov chain if you take the right domain of your variables. <coughs> so take this Markov chain, this is here. And now what you do, you equip this Markov chain with rewards. In the following sense, you take the successful termination state. All other states have reward zero. Yeah, because you're interested in establishing the post expectation, that's what you do in the successful termination states. And now what you do is you take, start from state S, your input, you eventually want to get to a successful termination state and on the way you should never violate an observation. So this is the expected reward in the countably infinite Markov chain that satisfies this property. And that's exactly what the WP does. Okay, what that means, yesterday it was asked what can you do with model checking? Well, this makes this very explicit. If you now have a finite state program, if your Markov chain is finite, so if this object is finite, you can take an off the shelf probabilistic model checkers such as prism or storm, and you can compute these WPs by doing model checking. Yeah, because you compute this measure. And this can be done in 
polynomial term. OK, so what can you do with this in terms of a Bayesian network? Well, here was the example before. So um, what you typically do is you can now, by standard Bayesian inference, what you do is you compute this, right? We are interested in, maybe I was a bit too quick, how likely does a well-prepared student end up with a bad mood after getting a bad grade for an easy exam? This boils down to computing this conditional probability. Yeah? Uh, the, he's, he's well prepared, easy exam, grade was low, and bad mood. Yeah? Good. Standard co conditional probabilities gives you rise to the following uh, 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 fraction. You read off the numbers in those tables, and that gives you 0.27. Good. Now we know that exact inference is NP complete or NP hard. Approximate inference actually is NP hard as well. Um, so typically what people do is you use simulation. And there are a whole plethora of simulation techniques. Rejection sampling is one of them. Actually, that's what I did with the observed statement. You do a repeat and you reject your sample until you satisfy your observed statement. You can do MCMC or importance sampling or whatever. Here I'm going to show you that you can also do weakest precondition reasoning. So what we are doing is uh, actually I'm going to show you that the kind of programs that describe Bayesian nets have a specific property. And that property allows you to, I mean, it gives you the fact that you do not have to compute a loop invariant. In general, you have to infer a loop invariant. I get to this. But here, you don't. And the crucial point is that we are going to consider expectations. Remember, functions mapping program states onto real numbers that are unaffected by a program P if the variables are not touched by P. What are the variables of an expectation? Those are the variables that really matter, that they are changing the value of F, intuitively speaking. And the key property is that if, the, if you have such an expectation which is not affected by P, then you can pull it out in the WP. So the WP of this program of the product G times F is G times the WP of P and F. This intuitively, I think, not so hard to see that this should hold. In some sense, there is no data in your P that affects G, intuitively speaking. Now I call a loop IID if it satisfies the following property. The WP of the body satisfying the guard is independent, is unaffected by P. Remember, this is a function. This is some F, right? And the WP on termination of the loop. What's the termination? It's not G times F. That is unaffected by P. Okay, this is what we call an IID loop. Good. So here is an example. Here's an example that I play darts. I would like to, uh, to get a point in the circle. And what you do is, again, rejection sampling. So as long as you have a point which is in the rectangle, yeah, then you take arbitrarily two points, x and y, according to a uniform distribution. And you do this as long as you get a point inside the circle. Okay? Good. This is IID, intuitively speaking. The values of x and y in the next iteration are independent of the values of the previous iteration. That's what intuitively it means. And you actually can calculate this. I, won't, I will skip the details, but this is an example of a program which is IID. No? Actually, it's IID for actually every f, not just for a given f, it's for every f. Good. So um, what you can do now is for all those IID loops, you can, uh, it's, it's okay to get the weakest precondition without computing a loop invariant. And this is calculated by this, uh, this formula. So the WP, so you take a loop which is IID, and you now would like to compute the WP of this loop with respect to F for some starting state S. And this you can capture by this closed form formula that basically says, okay, as long as the guard holds, this fraction holds, and as long as it doesn't hold, of course, you have to establish the post expectation, the post condition, right? Notice that you can sometimes have zero divided by zero, and just for the sake of uh, convenience, we define this here to be zero. So don't nail me down that this is bull bullshit, but this is the way we define it here. Um, the way to see this, that this works, it's, you can calculate the loop as a kind of geometric series, and this is actually kind of the resolution or the, the solution of, the ge of solving the geometric series. So the bottom line is, if you have an IID loop, no loop invariants are needed, OK? So I don't need any uh, invariant. I don't need a martingale. I don't need a ranking function. Things are easy. Good. So here is my uh, base network. Remember the question before. Actually, what you now can do, you can just easily convert this base network into a program. 
it's an acyclic graph. You take a topological sort. So here I take, for instance, the sort at D before followed by P and then G and M. I could also have swapped the first two, but let's take this one. Now I take a program for every vertex. So for instance, I just can take one vertex of the graph. And for instance, this is the table that was attached to, I think, uh, the grate. And here is the table. And of course, you can imagine that you can write this down as a nested if then else or as a case statement, trivially. Nothing special. Then the last part is that you condition on the evidence. Now the evidence was that the student was well prepared. So I condition on the fact that P equals 1. What does that mean? I'm going to not take this as the program of the BN, but I'm going to take this as the program, which is repeat the sequence of the program until you get the evidence. Remember, rejection sampling, observe statement, evidence. Okay, very simple. And now what you can prove is the following. Those BN programs naturally represent rejection sampling. It's exactly the repeat loop. Um, every BN program is IID for every expectation. It almost surely terminates. So nothing with termination, very simple. And the, the size is linear in the size of the base network. So what does that mean? I actually can prove that it's correct, but I guess you understand that this is correct. This statement just says that the WP of the program I just checked with respect to some, uh, let's say, all the variables that I did not observe is the same as the joint distribution of the base network that the program represents. Yeah? So this simply says in one line, the transformation I showed you obviously is correct. Good. So what does that mean? All ID loops, everything almost surely terminates. So WP reasoning equals base inference. This is what I would like to determine with base inference. This is what I do with WP. Good. So as BN programs are IID, you can fully automate this. Yeah, because you get a closed form formula. So this was the program, and now what you can do exact Bayesian inference, and what you can do is by Bayesian by uh, WP reasoning, you get exactly, of course, 0.27. Good. Okay, so what about termination? These are easy programs, they almost surely terminate, but in general, of course, a program does not almost surely terminate. So what do you use to how to prove termination of a program for a non-probabilistic program? You try to find something like a ranking function. Right, so here is my ranking function, it's V. It depends on the state at the beginning of an iteration that adds uh, superscript I. And this function, I mean, at some point goes down and if it terminates, it hits some kind of minimal value. In my picture, it's zero. Okay, so the loop iterations are on the Y axis. The value of the ranking function is on the X axis. So for non-probabilistic programs, it's pretty easy. You just have to have a well-founded domain and what you need to show is that, okay, if this is the value at the beginning of the fourth loop iteration, that's the, the value after the end of the fourth iteration, what do you have to show? You have to show that this value is in the ordering that you are considering for the well-founded order below the ordering of the, what you had. Okay? And because it's a well-founded order, you arrive at zero, and therefore you can prove termination. This does not work for probabilistic programs anymore. So um, actually there is this uh, seminal paper by Espaz et al. at CAF. He says that ordinary termination is a purely topological property, for, but almost sure termination is not. And he says you cannot take an off-the-shelf termination prover. You need to do something like arithmetic reasoning. No. Good. So actually proving almost sure termination for a single input is pi 2 complete. So it's as hard to prove for an ordinary program that it terminates for all inputs. Yeah, so that gives you some insight about the complexity or the hardness of the problem. And the same, by the way, holds if you want to be interested in can you approximate probability 1 up to epsilon. Good. So this program we had before, with, uh, here the observed statement is gone, but this was the geometric distribution. This program does not, of course, always terminate. It, I mean, hypothetical case, it could be the case that in this loop iteration you flip this coin and every time you get C becomes true. Now, infinitely often doing this is measure zero. This is the only non-terminating run, so this program terminates with probability one. Fine. Um, here you have a symmetric random walk. So this is a one line. You start at some arbitrary position, let's say 10, and then you loop, you walk, and at every position you flip a fair coin, and you go one position to the left or one position to the right. 
Okay? One dimensional random walk. Bounded at zero because that's my termination criteria. This uh, program uh, is out of reach for many proof rules. To prove that this almost surely terminates is not easy. That's what I'm saying. Yeah? And there are many proof rules around that are not able to cope with this. And, but what can you observe from this program? The observation is that a loop iteration decreases x by 1 with probability a half. Right? Obvious. I'm going to show you that this observation alone is enough to prove that this indeed almost surely terminates. No further reasoning. What's the problem in ordinary proof rules to prove this? That typically people reason about the expected value, but you can imagine that here the expected value does not change. Yeah? So it's not easy to prove actually the termination of this program. So what I'm going to show you is a new proof rule for proving almost sure termination. So the goal is to prove almost sure termination of a while loop. And the ingredients are the following. The first thing is I need a super martingale, which is a random variable, v. So my ranking function now, it becomes a random variable. And this function is a super martingale, and that's exactly written down in the first bullet here. That's the property of being a super martingale. OK, it maps states onto non-negative reals. If you run the body, then you should not increase its expected value. And the loop iteration ceases if the super martingale is equal to 0. Good. What else do I need? I need two functions, namely p and d. Smaller than i for super martingale. This, that's a super martingale. Yeah, it's a super. This is super. Yeah, so it's smaller, smaller. I think this is, OK. I checked it yesterday, but OK. Let's not argue about it. But, uh, <laughs> Maybe I made a mistake. Here, but it's uh, intuitive, right? This would not prove termination, it would prove divergence. No, but this is V n, n plus 1, right? It goes the other way around, right? Ah, okay, sorry. sorry yeah? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Ah. Sorry, <laughs> Good. Sorry. Yeah? Okay. So, um, but in, in, more importantly, there is a progress condition. In addition to the super martingale, we need two functions. P stands for probability, D stands for decrease. These are not constants. They depend on the current value of your ranking function, of your super martingale. Okay? So it's p depends on the value v, and d depends on v, and they're antitone. Okay? Good. Then, if this holds, if you get this together, you can prove that the while loop almost surely terminates on every input. Good. Let me show you the intuition. So this is the intuition, same picture as before, but now v is the super martingale. So let's look at two loop iterations, the first after the first loop and the second loop. What does this say? It says, well, OK, there is a certain distance between these two values, not necessarily the distance between these two. There is a distance, and this distance is there with a certain probability, at least this probability. OK, now you look at another loop iteration a bit further on. So you look at the fourth and the fifth. So uh, uh, I mean, basically, you look at the fourth loop iteration. Again, the same principle, right? Again, you have a distance depending on the value at the start of that iteration. And this happens with a probability at least depending on the value at the start of the iteration. Yeah, it's, not, it's not a constant epsilon. It's an epsilon that depends on where you are. That's the crucial point here. Good. Then we know that they're antitone. So what does that mean? It means that this d is at most this d. The d gets larger if the function goes to 0, intuitively speaking. And in addition, p is antitone, and that means that this happens with a higher and higher and higher probability. Okay? And we need this because otherwise you get one and a half or the quarter, etc., and you never hit zero. Yeah? So that would not be sufficient, but you need something like this. And then actually, almost surely you arrive at zero, and this is guaranteed by the proof rule. So basically, the main principle is the closer to termination, the more v decreases, and this becomes more and more likely. Okay, this is what the proof rule says. Um, has yesterday been presented at Popol, by the way. Um, so let's now look at what it means in terms of the symmetric random loop, random walk. So here is the loop, the walk. What do we need? Well, this is all we need. V, the ranking function, is the position where you are, x. Then what was the observation? In every iteration with probability half, your position changes by one. That's all. This satisfies the conditions of the proof rule End of proof. Uh, Steven, no, of course. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that I can automate finding v. I'm only telling you in this example, it's easy to find v. Yeah? 
We're not automating finding V. So here is another example. It's a, a symmetric uh, in the limit random walk. So what is this? This program looks as follows. So you start at some position. Again, you would like to get to the target zero. But now you have a parametric probability. The probability changes on the position where you are in the random walk. It's x divided by 2x plus 1. So R, if you are at position, uh, let's say, 2, then with probability 2 fifths, you go to the left. But with a higher probability, your drift is to the right. Okay, the same here, 4 over 7, 3 over 7. In the limit, you never reach this, it's a half and a half. It's the random walk I had on the previous slide. It's not obvious that this almost surely terminates. It does. Yeah. Good, so how to prove this? So you can prove this as follows. Again, Alessandro, I have to find the V myself. V is H of X, and H is the harmonic number corresponding to the position in the random walk. Okay, let's take it for granted. Uh, P is a one-third, interesting, and D is one over X if you are between the two harmonic numbers between X minus one and X. Okay, I'm not saying it's easy to find these functions, but what I'm saying is now you can easily check the conditions of the theorem and then you show that almost surely this program terminates. You say it's not easy to find the functions. Can you guarantee that the function doesn't exist? Is that easy to do? Because I'm thinking of when the work in three dimensions, no. it looks very no. similar. No. No. no, 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 no. I get to this completely at the line, last slide. Yeah? The proof, will, I can, we cannot prove that it's uh, completeness. Okay. Yeah? I do not even know for which classes or program it holds. The only thing I can say is the following. This proof rule covers many almost surely terminating programs than other proof rules can do. That's, that's the, uh, the, the, that's the that's yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so I try to be weak, okay. yeah? Good. Okay, so the last part of my talk, I would like to talk about runtime analysis. So this so far, it was about correctness. Now I would like to talk about how long does a program run on average? <coughs> and this is important because actually here is my random walk again. It almost surely terminates but the expected runtime of this program, so that's the expected number of steps that this program takes until hitting zero, is infinite. Yeah, interesting. It's almost surely terminate, but on average you'd have infinitely many steps to get to this point. Okay. Actually, deciding whether a program, what we call positively almost surely terminates, so almost surely terminates infinitely many accepted steps, is pi 3 complete. It's one level up in the hierarchy. Actually, you can show, I don't uh, show this here, that this property is not preserved on the sequential composition. What does that mean? I give you two programs. They are positively almost surely terminating. I do the sequential composition. The composite is not. Nonetheless, I'm going to argue that you can analyze expected runtimes in a compositional manner. OK, the way we're going to do that is by WP. And the way to do that is I'm going to explain you that this is a variant of the WP. It's now ERT. So ERT is a transformer that takes an expectation in a program and gives you an expectation. And the way to read this is that you would like to get a bound on the expected runtime of P, given that the rest after P takes T time units. Yeah, so it's something like a continu uh, continuation passing semantics. And why do we need this? Because we want to read compositionally. Good. So what you can do, you can define this uh, by induction on the structure of the programs. By the way, I'm a little bit more liberal here because I allow x to be a sample of a, dis of a discrete random variable, mu. But for the rest, it's the basically the same. I'm going to skip the details, but of course, we take some kind of cost model here. Yeah? The cost of, an, of a statement is deterministic. And of course, you can argue about how long a statement will take. But for instance, the skip takes one time unit. Diverge, of course, is infinite because it diverges. Uh, doing this assignment takes one time unit plus doing the assignment itself. Uh, an observed statement, you have to evaluate the guard. This takes you one time unit. So everywhere where you see the one, it's a deterministic time of your cost of executing a statement. And of course, we can argue about which cost to take. Let's just argue that we take one. Yeah? So for a loop, again, you have a least fixed point, but you have one to evaluate the guard of the loop, and then you have to have the loop body, or you terminate. Good. OK, and mu is the least fixed point of doing this. OK, and now you can uh, develop a set of proof rules because now we want to reason about loops, right? I mean, in the same way I sh showed you before, if you have a loop-free program, you can just uh, compute it step by step. The interesting part is what happens if you have a loop. So we have a bunch of proof rules, and I will show you not the proof rule, but I will show you an example. 
So look at this program. It's not even probabilistic. It's trivial, right? So what's the runtime of this program? The way we're going to compute is that we compute an invariant that is an approximation of the lower bound of the runtime. Actually, in practice, it's much harder to find a lower bound than an upper bound. But I would like to have a lower bound. And my claim is I do this in inductively over the number of loop unfoldings, which is the subscript n. So jn is approximating from below running this loop n times, intuitively speaking. Good. That's one, because we have to evaluate the guard. Plus, well, if x is between this thing, every loop iteration takes two statements, evaluating the guard, doing the assignment. If you terminate, which happens if this guard holds, yeah, it's something like 2n minus 1. Good. What is now the theorem? It says that if the limit of this jn exists, which in this case is the case, just take the limit of this thing, it's 1 plus x over 2 times 2x. This is the theorem says this is a lower bound of the runtime of the loop. What does this theorem says? Or what does the result says? You have to evaluate the guard, and if x is larger than zero, you have to multiply times two times the initial value of x. Okay, I hope you get some feeling that this says something about the lower bound on the runtime of the loop. Okay, good. Again, those j's you have to find by hand. Yeah? I can't give you an algorithm to do that. Yeah? Undecidable. Okay, now look at the same program as before, but now I have one program that does something before, namely it has this loop iteration over C. In every iteration you flip a fair coin and based on this you terminate. And what else do you do in the iteration? You double x. So rather than incrementing it as we had before, I now double x. Again, I do the analysis. I would like to analyze the runtime of this program. Good. Claim. We are using templates for invariants, so we're going to guess an invariant, and this invariant looks as follows. One, for evaluating this guard. Then, if the guard doesn't hold, then we have to run the rest of the program, and this was the result of the previous slide. If that doesn't hold, so if the guard holds, I don't know yet. So I take a template. The an and bn are my template variables. Now we have some conditions on being a lower invariant. These conditions allow you to deduce certain constraints on these template variables. And now you can solve this and by just an ordinary constraint solver. And it tells you, okay, the solutions are a n is 7 minus 5 over 2 to the power n and b n is n. Now plug this in here. The crucial point is that this equals n. And now if you take the limit for n to infinity, the runtime of this program is infinite. And actually, this is the example that shows you that positive almost surely terminating is not closed on the sequential composition. Because the, four pr the first program is positively almost surely terminating, the second also, but the combination not. What's the intuition? The intuition is that the termination probability of the first program is exponentially decaying. And in some sense, this is compensated by the exponential growth of x in every iteration. And then if you take the expected value, you get a sum over once. Intuition. Okay, um, what else can you do? You can try to analyze uh, interesting randomized algorithms. So one example is the coupons collector, which have been analyzed by many people. And if you look to Wikipedia, you get something like this. So the easiest way to explain this is that you have a dice, six-sided dice, and you would like to know how long do I have to throw the die on average until I have seen all possible outcomes. So one, two, three, four, five, six, at least once. Good. And if you have a more-sided die, then you look at this table. So if you have a 40-sided die, yeah, you need 172 times on average. So you can write this down in a program. I'm not going to explain you the details. I hope you understand you can write this down in some way in a program. And now what you can do, provided you have the right invariance, Alessandro, again, you have to do some... Yeah, You can prove now in a completely formal way, a la Floyd Hoare, that the runtime of this program is actually in theta n log n. And actually somebody from the group of Tobias Nipkov in Munich took our proof and actually checked it by means of a theorem prover. So there is no hand-waving arguments, no arguments by saying it's obvious to see from the code such and such. It's completely machine checkable. The result was known, but I think uh, to having a machine checkable proof, it's not. Okay, the last part, how can you apply this now to base networks? Okay, so let's do this. So there is this claim, very nice paper, um, 
by Gordon, Nori, Hensinger, Radiamani. The main challenge in this setting, and the setting is sampling-based analysis of probabilistic programs, is that many samples are generated during execution, but they're ultimately rejected because they don't satisfy your evidence. Okay? So the question is, how long on average do you need to sample in order to get a sample that is conforming to your evidence? Good, so here is a network which is parametric. There is a parameter A here, and I want to uh, I give you some evidence. So uh, suppose I give you the evidence G equals zero. The question is, how long on average do I need to sample until I get an IID sample, one sample, that satisfies this evidence? You can compute this function by hand. Uh, I skipped this uh, thing. Uh, this is the function you get, and this is the curve. The curve is on the left. This is only two times zooming in. So if A is very small, then you only need very few samples. But if A is larger, the number of samples grows exponentially. Actually, this is made explicit here. The expected sample time is below 18 for large range of A's. But if A is this, then you need 100 samples. In real life, the example I showed you about the, the printer troubleshooting, right? Computing one IID sample takes 10 to the power 15, yeah? Time. That's why people, uh, why this is a hard uh, BN actually. If you talk to people in BN, then they say, this is a hard case. Yeah, because this holds. Yeah? It's ill-conditioned in some sense. Okay, I have to wrap up. Um, what I'm going to show you is you can find a closed form formula for the runtime of your base network. You can fully automate this. This I skipped, this example as before. I'm going to skip a couple of slides. So what you get is this example with the student. You would like to know, here is the program. I'm interested in the expected runtime, the same WP I showed you before, the same as for the coupon collector with respect to zero. And uh, what you can do, you can apply the closed form formula and you get 23.4. So almost 23 and a half samples are needed or runs are needed to get one IID sample. Okay, this has been implemented and we looked at several BNs from uh, the benchmark bnlearn.com. So here you see some uh, example of those BNs. The BNs are in the first column, and the troubleshooter problem of Windows uh, 95 is in the third row. The first three columns say something about the size of the BN. So they range up to from 50 nodes up to 1,000, the number of edges, and this is what they call the average Markov blanket. It says something about the independence in your base network. Okay, so they say something about how dependent are your random variables in your base network. And here you see the number of observations, the expected sample time, the thing that you can compute. And this is the amount of time we need to compute these values. So green tells you how long does our tool need to compute the red values. Okay? Sometimes you get infinity. What does that mean? Yeah, it's ill-conditioned. You condition on an evidence, but you will never find a sample that is going to accomplish this evidence. But you can automatically generate or get this result. Okay, so here is the printer troubleshooting in Windows 95. Um, we analyzed this, and actually we also made a Java implementation that does the real uh, simulation. And uh, that actually means that you execute about 10 to the power 7 simulation steps in a single second. And that means that uh, if you get an expected sample time of 10 to the power 15, previous slide, this means, and I'm not claiming this is the optimal implementation, right? But it gives you some indication that in order to get a single IID sample, you need 3.6 years of simulating. Yeah. So maybe it's sometimes wise to have this information and then you use exact inference rather than simulation. Okay, this brings me to the end. Um, what we do is analyze probabilistic programs at the source code level. I reason like a la Floyd Hoare at the program level, a la Dijkstra. And we do this compositionally. And I think these two aspects are important, code plus compositionally. There are many open problems. I think we are only at the start. And I'm the first to admit that, of course, we built on the sh shoulders of giants like Cozen, MacGyver, and Morgan. But I think there are many more uh, challenges in this field that we can uh, tackle with this kind of techniques. Some of them are mentioned. I mean, completeness I already mentioned. Completeness of this proof rule is a very exciting thing. Some of the results you can also have if you have non-determinism, but not all of them. And of course, the question which is at the bottom, especially for Alessandro, how to find invariance. And for subclasses, linear programs and so on, we know this, and you can automate this, but in general, of course, this is a very, very tough problem. 
Finally, I would like to thank my co-authors, and if you're interested in the details, here are the papers listed where all the results are mentioned. Thanks a lot for the attention.